So thanks for um, that introduction, uh, Marie Claire. I um, thought long and hard about what I should say today uh, to people who've got a lot more lived experience than me, but I thought what I would do is share with you my prejudices and how I've arrived at them and maybe share um, quite a personal journey for me, which has took me quite a long time to talk about uh, as an adult. So, um, and that's because for a long time, you're made to feel like you're, lived experience journey is one of um, shame. And I, I think sometimes we make ourselves feel like that. So I'm the chief exec of P3. I've been here for 18 years. I was the 13th member of staff. We were overdrawn when I started and we were going bust. Today we turn over 30 million quid. We employ 700 people. We have about 350 volunteers and we work with 17,000 people a year. Our work is really simple. Uh, we help people with somewhere to live, something to do, and hopefully someone to love. It's based around three themes, place, people, and purpose. Um, and all of our services are relational. We don't do transactional services very well. So um, it's a bit more complicated than I say, but that's probably enough about um, P3. So what I want to kind of explain to you is really why I think the way I do and I've, why I've tried to address some of the more negative things that I think and how I've arrived at working out why I feel like that. Some of you find this stuff useful, some of you will find it boring, most of you will forget it within a week so that's fine um, but be warned I, I don't mind fake smiles on the screen and bogus laughter just to cheer me up as we go along through the speech so feel free to humour me. Um, I'm a nurse by uh, background and in my early nursing career I worked in the private sector I worked for the Priory group and they sent us all on this corporate training event thing to learn to be better leaders and better managers and they had this bloke there who was like an explorer and, and he got trapped up a mountain and, and broke his legs and managed to drag himself down the mountain and, and we got to learn about this as a, a lesson in uh, leadership I just thought the whole thing was very weird because um, I thought I'd rather hear from somebody who'd had a long, successful, happy career in leadership rather than an overly optimistic sportsman who got stuck up a mountain. Um, so I, I'm not going to teach you anything about uh, lived experience, but I'm just going to tell you my story and hope that it resonates. I'm not particularly an inspirational speaker, so don't, um, you know, don't stand any stead by that, but um, here we go. So through a series of fortunate incidents, I've um, arrived at, at my job today. It's a job I love, that's why I've been here 18 years. But way back in the 60s, um, when my mum had me, uh, we would have been described today as what's a family with complex needs, I think is the, the current term. We'd have been on a programme. What really she was, was my mum was a woman in the swinging 60s who took a bit too much to pop in a few pills and got knocked up by my dad when she was 18. Um, and my dad um, was the one who was giving her the pills and turned out to be quite a successful drug dealer throughout his life. Um, maybe that's where I get my enterprising spirit from. Uh, I don't know, but he was quite a significant drug dealer till his uh, uh, early death. Anyway, in the 60s, I had to go and live with my grandma because my mum couldn't uh, look after me until my mum got married and we moved up north um, to go and work in uh, my dad got a job in my dad mum's new partner got a job in the northeast to go and work in steel so now my mum was a suitably married woman off we went up north I think largely to reinvent uh, our family history where my uh, mum was married and I'd been there all along anyway a few years later steel was dead um, the future was definitely in the pits and the mining industry so we moved back to the pits uh, got, my dad got a job in the pits, Maggie Thatcher was elected, we lost our house, we ended up living in a homeless hostel with six other families um, and there was, by now mum and, mum and dad got three more kids and there were six of us living in one room. I thought it was brilliant, I was about um, 11 or 12 and um, it, we, we had a great time in that hostel because one, we didn't really understand what homeless meant. Two, we thought it was brilliant, there's always somebody to play with. 
and and three we used to spend loads of time going out shoplifting with the other kids who lived in the hostel because um it was kind of a bit of a game but also the fact that none of us had got any money anyway pretty soon after the community and the family stepped in to help my mum i had to go and live with my auntie kath quite far away Neighbours were really kind. They gave us second-hand toys and clothes and stuff. You'll know this story, I'm sure. Um, I didn't know we didn't have much because nobody had much then. We lived in mining villages and the, and the strike was on. Um, you didn't know how to say thank you because it was expected of everybody. But eventually, uh, we got a council house and we were moved on to an estate in Not Nottinghamshire called Coxmoor, which I now know to be one of the roughest estates you're likely to come across. And I loved it. We were all living together. We didn't know it was rough. We knew it wasn't posh because posh people lived in the wimpy houses just over the way and they had quiche and olives and we didn't have quiche or, and we definitely didn't eat olives. But we had a great time um, living on cocky. I was quite bright, so I did quite well at school until I discovered drinking and weed, and I discovered that I like drinking and weed a lot more than school. Um, and I spent a lot of time doing that, uh, drinking and weed. It was the 80s. I was thin and I'd got a Mohican. I looked quite the bomb then uh, with a joint on trying to get into pubs. But eventually I decided to get my act together. And when I was 17, went back to school, did my O-levels and A-levels in the same year. And eventually, start to train as a social worker. I realised now that would have been a, a very bad thing. I'd have been a terrible social worker. And my dad again lost his job. This was still, uh, you know, Thatcher was still in and we were still struggling around employment around these ear parts. So I had to leave college and um, get a job. And the job I got actually was as a, as a student nurse. And that was just by chance. I met a bloke on a bus who, who crashed me a fag. I'd got a light, he'd got no light. I asked me for a light. I asked him for a fag. Got talking to him and he'd been in um, a mental health unit and was telling me about what it was like in a mental health unit. He was on his way home. And I thought, I reckon that's a job I could do. And in those days you had job centres where you could just walk in and look at the jobs board. And I walked in and looked at the jobs board and became applied to be a, a student nurse um, training in, I actually trained in Worcestershire at a place called Barnsley Hall. And I thought this was going to be the making of me. I'd got no aspiration to go to university because we couldn't afford it. And um, off I went on the bus, got off at Digbeth and then another service bus to Barnsley Hall. And I trained for three years at Barnsley Hall and witnessed the worst acts of degradation and spitefulness I'd ever seen in, in the name of care while I was training to be an RMN. But I also saw the greatest acts of compassion and kindness and they were largely from uh, people like the cleaners and, and the people who did um, the meals and stuff and, and unqualified staff because mostly the, the unkindness and uh, spitefulness had not been quite trained into them. We did terrible things like we bathed five people in the same bath water and shaved the same five people with the same big razor. And uh, time moved on a bit. I got my, who is now my wife, pregnant when she was 18 and I was 20 and I was still a, a, a student. I moved my training back to the Midlands and we moved into a council house. This was in the days when you, you could get a council house. And for the last 28 years, I've been doing a job where I've treated people in exactly the opposite way to which I was trained. My mum, by the way, went on to run a very successful housing association and also was the chair of a local authority that had the reputation for really evicting anyone for rent arrears. And um, I think there's definitely a connection between our experience and that. I've been really fortunate in this time. I've mostly been in charge where I've worked. I've learned loads of stuff on the way, professionally, personally, and culturally. I won't bore you with the detail of all of that, but I have worked with some of the most kind, inspiring, and compassionate people I've ever come across, because we've always, at P3 and my previous organization, focused on people as people first, rather than where they're from or what they know, but actually focusing on the humanity of people. And one of the privileges of being the boss a lot is that I rarely work with horrible people. Um, and I hope that horrible people don't stay around me for very long because we've managed to um, get rid of them by one way or another. Rightly or wrongly, when you're the gaffer, you pick up a bit of knowledge. And I want to share some of the things that I've learned. Um, and, and you'll have to forgive some of the language uh, here. The first thing I want to talk about is prejudice and why I think about some of the things that I do. 
um, prejudices are like arseholes. We've all got them. We never want to talk about them and we never really want to see them in action. There's great wisdom in this. And, and I would add that opinions slightly differ from our souls in that we should constantly take our opinions and our prejudices out, examine them closely, work out where they've come from and work out what we can do to improve them. We must think critically about the ideas of others, be hard on our own beliefs, take them out, examine them, hold the mirror up to them, be intellectually rigorous and identify your biases. I used to not really have a lot of time for posh people because I always thought they were trying to con me or they were all Tories and inherently bad. And that goes a long way back to my, um, my childhood and thinking about the experience we had at the experience of the uh, Thatcher government. Um, respecting people, all people, but especially those that um, have less power than you. Most of the important decisions I've made about promoting or recruiting people is based on how clever, motivated or, or bright they are. But actually, the thing that always swings it for me is how they treat people, clients, peers, subordinates, volunteers, uh, you know, anyone, but how they treat human beings. It's especially important to me because when I was homeless as a kid, um, we were made to feel like, um, like we were poor. Uh, there was lots of signalling around uh, uh, poverty and about how you get treated, about the fact that we were interviewed by social workers about every three or four weeks and had to recount to them what we'd had to eat and had we got holes in our shoes and all that kind of um, stuff. Um, what started to shine through for me there was kindness and how kindness comes from respect. And in the services that we commission today at P3, that the, the game that we enter as P3 and lots of organisations do, kindness is not commissioned, it can't be, it has to sit in the people that work and live and volunteer in services. And that's something culturally that we try and harness at P3 and something that um, I try and instil in our workforce about the dignity of a human connection and what kindness can do for that. And I always say to people at our induction, I will judge you on how you treat the least powerful. So there, that's my prejudice and I can't do anything about that. Um, the other thing oh, I've learned to listen yeah. to is the thing about not having a dream. I'll try and pick up Marie Claire. About no, you don't having, rush. <laughs> about not having a dream, because I think this was always a thing. And, and lots of people have said, you know, I'm not really sure what to do with my life. Well, be like the rest of us. Um, if your dream's big enough, it'll take you most of your life to achieve it. So by the time you get to it, you're staring into the meaningless of your achievement because you're nearly dead usually by the time you've achieved it. Try and be kinder to yourself, have ambition, mark that journey with lots of short term goals and be micro ambitious. It will honestly make you happier when you achieve things. If you constantly strive for achievement, you'll be constantly disappointed that you haven't achieved your dream. Just put your head down and work with pride. Just be aware that the next big thing for you will probably appear out the corner of your eye. And if you're not looking for it, it'll just happen over a coffee or a cup of tea or a GMT, or in the case with me and Marie Claire over LinkedIn, where we kind of just made friends and it's probably been one of the best things that I've ever done. So don't constantly seek happiness, keep busy, try and make someone else happy because you'll usually make yourself happy along the way. Mm. Seek justice, don't be superstitious because that can really drag you down. I've got people who won't do things because it's failed before and it was a bad time in their life. Don't define, define yourself by the number of likes, define yourself by what we look. We spend a lot of time in this country being anti-stuff, against things. You really find people who are pro-stuff talk passionately about what they care about. Understand you can't truly create, take credit for all your successes or blame failure on everyone else. My final lesson is be steady as you go. It's ridiculous that we always have to seem to be striving for something. Soon you will be dead. Life will seem long and tough and God, especially in coronavirus, it's tiring. And sometimes you'll be happy and sometimes you'll be sad and then you'll be old and then you'll be dead. All yeah. these things are surely certain. There's only one sensible thing to do with this. Live life to the full, love generously, love unquestioningly, learn as much as you can from as many people as you can, 
but most of all, be kind, because no one will ever commission that. It's down to us as human beings to do that. And never live with the shame of being homeless, because it's nothing to be ashamed of.